Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Pond, awards editor of The Wrap, and we're so happy to have you here for our awards season screening series, um, screening of Shelter, Ireland's entry in the Oscars Best International Feature Film category. We're going to start by showing you the trailer to the film, and then we'll go right into a conversation with director Sean Brethnock and producer Patty Hayes. To our audience, please participate in the live chat, share your thoughts about the film, and let us know where you're tuning in from. Now, before we introduce our guests, let's take a look at the trailer. When I get scared, the shawl. The shawl. The shawl. Time she thought could have let you have more fun now. Tally, you do. You're so good, you're emotional. Welcome back. It's my pleasure to introduce director Sean Brethnock and producer Patty Hayes. Welcome, gentlemen. Hi. Nice to be here. Greetings from the west of Ireland, Steve. <laughs> yes. Um, the, the west of Ireland, which we see a lot of in, in your film. Um, so are you both based? Um, you're both based in the west? Yeah. yeah. There's a Costa del Sol in Galway, Ireland, and we live in the Costa del Sol of Galway. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. Green cross, but yeah, we were on the, the west coast of Galway. Uh, yeah. um, well, congratulations on, on a terrific film. Um, I mean, Sean, I know before this, you've mostly made short films and, and documentaries. I mean, is is a, you know, a a, na a narrative feature, something you'd been you'd been looking to do? Oh, most definitely. I think that was the ambition and dream since I was, you know, 11 years old, 12 years old, but you don't really get the opportunities all that often. And I was very lucky to uh, meet this guy, Paddy Hayes, our producer, who um, approached me with uh, Donald Ryan's brilliant novel, uh, Think About December. I guess because I had some experience in, I made a short film with similar themes. I think maybe he saw a connection or way of bringing me with this material and that allowed us to search for some funding and to get to make it. So I feel very privileged, I must say. Right. Um, so Patty, I mean, what was it, what was it about this novel that made you think there was a movie there and, and, and then why was Sean the right guy? Um, well, I can say now that Sean was the right guy, but when I ch chose him initially, I wasn't sure if he was the right guy. <laughs> Let's be clear with that. Um, Donald Ryan is a twice Booker long listed author from Ireland. And uh, once every five years or so, you come across a book where there's an Irish character where you recognize him as quintessentially Irish, but totally universal. This is a, a guy from rural Ireland who you meet every day, um, someone who didn't really get ahead in life, but is really part of the community. Um, so it's kind of very interesting character. And Donal uh, wrote this uh, John Cunliffe character, who I think will live long in, in, in the Irish psyche as a, a really someone he, he nailed as a quintessentially Irish character. Um, Sean had written and directed a couple of short films for us prior to that, exploring similar themes. Um, and really, uh, I just didn't know how you can get behind the eyes of a character li like this, but I could see that Sean could actually do it. Uh, you know, they say you cannot photograph thought, um, but in actual fact, that is the challenge, is to 
people who maybe are not quite of this world to try and get into their head and see the world through their eyes. So Sean, uh, not that he's like that in his personal life, uh, <laughs> he seems to manage to be able to get in behind the eyes of these guys who are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, let, let's talk a bit about the main character, John John Cunliffe. I mean, he's what is he? he's he's in his mid to late twenties, but he's been basically sheltered by his parents his whole life. Um, and when they when they die, he's sort of forced to, um, you know, to be out there in a way that he he hadn't been before. I mean, his his shelter is is basically gone. Um, and what I think is, I mean, so so interesting, you know, he's he's sort of emotionally stunted in certain ways at the least, but there's never a t an attempt to place a diagnosis on him. He's just, um, you know, I mean, Sean, what was it about the character that that appealed to you? I think I could recognize a lot of people I know in the character. I think that was appealing. It was appealing to, and challenging, and I like the idea of, of the challenge that it, that it would have given me to try and visually convey someone like this who isn't a great communicator and uh, lives a sheltered life and doesn't really, who, who really thinks things through in a very slow and deliberate manner. So I just thought that challenge would be kind of interesting visually. I knew whatever we came up with in the script would be, I would hope anyway, uh, visually interesting. So that really attracted me. Uh, but like I said, um, in our part of the world, um, you see a, a lot of people like John Cunliffe and um, you pass them by, you might know them, you might see them in the shops, uh, they're quiet, they're introverted, they don't speak very much. And it's kind of interesting to wonder what they do when they go home, inevitably alone, by themselves, how they live their lives, how they have fun, how they sleep, eat, all of that. So I just thought it, I just thought that would be fascinating and very true, definitely to our side of the world. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, you have you have a central character, and it's very much you know the whole movie is very much through his, through his eyes, but. You're not going to get him to explain what he's going through or talk about what he's feeling or, or any of that so you've got to find another way to get it across very much and um i i, can, I must say i i like movies that do that i like like movies that let you kind of fill in a few blanks when you're the when you're the audience and the, the big ambition was to have the audience as they leave the auditorium to to really reflect on this guy and wonder what was next for him and think about how he got to where he was. Um, a lot of people ask me actually, um, does he suffer from some form of condition or what? Or they, they assume perhaps that he suffers from some form of condition. But I always say that he's been shaped by his environment and we just try to show that environment and give a bit of his backstory and his heritage and what was involved. And uh, again, you, you just hope that people will fill in the blanks and come to like him and come to see him and come to recognize something in him. Yeah. Um, now, my understanding is is that the film is based more on on some characters from from the novel than on the, the plot and all of the novel itself. I mean, Patty, when you went to Sean, was was that the idea to just take take parts of this rather than let's adapt this book? Uh, to be honest, no. Um, it was the characters that jumped out for me initially, uh, and I thought they could be great fun. The structure of the book then changed, but the characters were kept. I guess what I really like about John Cunliffe, we see many, many movies that talk about how our parents messed us up through neglect, through abuse, through um, general alcoholism this there's a great range out there but this is the story of somebody who's messed up as being over loved and over causative which is uh most unusual so that that was something in the character that i thought was great and that's you know, kind of donald ryan's work also the donald ryan's novel had a lot of interior monologues in it uh, and we were able to tap into that to really draw uh an interesting movie character because he had all that groundwork done. And um, Donald O'Haley, another Donald, uh, mm -hmm. who played the main part, really 
use that as a wellspring for his inspiration for the character, which is very useful. So it was really the characters um, that was the the birth of the movie, interestingly. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, Sean, when you, when you looked at the book, was it was it the the character? I mean, did you feel right away that you know the the structure and, and all would have to change dramatically? Yeah, it was an organic process. Um, I ended up writing fifteen drafts, and you know some of the earlier drafts were quite different from what we finished up with. But uh, you know, it's it's always going to be a challenge to adapt a novel to the screen. Um, you know, there was three hundred odd pages in the in the novel. You've ninety odd minutes for the screen. Uh, you have to pick and choose um, what you're going to use and the, the plot and whatnot. So. It certainly evolved. It wasn't obvious to me at the beginning what we'd keep and lose. Um, but as we went through the different drafts, you could see that um, there were certain strands in the story that had to be, like certain characters had to be amalgamated. So, you know, the you have the, you have the, the kind of the local businessman. He's an amalgamation of, of two characters, a few neighbors from the novel and the local businessman. So you, you, you're set these challenges and the novel, of course, is set through a calendar year from January through December. And you find out what the thing about December is at the very ending of the novel. So that was, I don't, I didn't think we could use that structure. You know, we, we couldn't divide our 90 minutes into 12 sections, say, whereby um, you're, you're going into the past of and his thoughts and this and these interior thoughts that, that you'd have. So we had to bring him out a little bit more and we had to introduce him a little bit more to the, uh, the Siobhan character and the Dave character and to, to make him move around a bit more, I think. Um, but, you know, those were the challenges. Uh, it, was, it was very enjoyable. Uh, you definitely had the the the, a lot of the heavy lifting and was done by Don Ryan, if you like, and I could just jump around and pick instances in his life, which I thought portrayed the character really well or gave a sense of him. And of course, we went with the, the particularly visually interesting and stimulating pieces, the, 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 the more cinematic scenes. And then we put our own spin on it as well, because the novel is, although Ireland is a small country, the novel is set in the Midlands. We moved it to the Irish speaking region in the West. So, you know, that's that's like the difference between the East Coast and the West Coast in the States, I'd say, you know, just quite, quite different, different language and different, um, different lands, different landscapes and uh, all of that. So, I've come around this in a long way, but to, to answer your question, I guess you, I'd say it was quite organic, and um, but always directed by this main character, John Clun, who I did know would be in every scene. So that was a creative decision, and I think that was that was a good decision when, when you look at the performance of Donald O'Haley. And I knew we'd stop, would end at a point that would show the change in the character and that's what we ended up doing yeah right so so patty as the producer when this is going through you know 15 different versions of of the script are you uh are you are, are you getting impatient are you worried oh i only read two of them <laughs> <laughs> no far from it um actually we have a kind of a maxim here trust in the process uh, with every draft, it was improving. Um, there's a couple of things that were hard to break. In, in actual fact, the ending of the book is very different. Uh, and to crack the ending and to have a goal to aim towards, I mean, uh, John Conliffe is an outsider uh, in every every bone, every sinew in his body. He's an outsider. And we love stories of outsiders. Um, but there was quite a negative ending in, in the book. Uh, this is more positive ending in the film. Uh, so to, once we had that kind of established that we were heading that path, I think that cracked a lot of, uh, opened a lot of cracks, I suppose, in terms of the, the steps we needed to do to get there. Um, so I, I wouldn't be terribly surprised, uh, you know, if I were to do it again, to adapt 
uh, a book or a novel to the screen that you will go through so many drafts. Uh, there's just so many flipping opportunities. There's so many different ways of um, making that omelette um, that you can do go down a few blind alleys, but you have to go down the blind alleys to dismiss them, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's very I'm true. talking, even though it's only on Zoom, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. You do have to go down some blind alleys. You have to earn the right to know where to go, I think. So you work with the different characters and you try and understand their motivations and where they want to go. And uh, sometimes that opens up something else for another character or another part of the plot or another part of the story. So I think it's it's like earning the right to 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 get to the end, and mm -hmm. if it takes fifteen drafts, if it takes five drafts, it takes five hundred drafts. I think you just have to do that. Also, yeah. Sean did quite a bit of workshopping with the actors. We uh, Sean is has a quite a theatrical approach in that regard, um, so he got the actors quite early, which meant that you know it didn't really change the structure a whole lot, but certainly the kind of within the scenes. Uh, things changed a bit but you might even not agree with that John did the workshopping change the structure I think we think we had a rough structure uh, we had we had our three acts and we knew where we were going to we knew our roughly our destination but what we did do in the workshops uh, particularly with the show on character is we tried to uh, you know add a little bit more of a backstory and motivation to her She's a little more marginalized, I think, in the in the novel. And that's a lot of that came from Fanil Flaherty, who plays Sean in, in the film. And she used some of her own life experiences in shaping the character. And I recorded all of our workshops and then wrote subsequent drafts. You know, a lot of the dialogue came from that, for example. So again, it just that just felt like the right way to do this. Um, I hadn't made a feature before, and um, but I know from my short film experience that you should be open to, to experimentation and you should be open to a lot, give, giving a little responsibility to the actors, especially in how they say what they're going to say. I'm a great believer in less is more, but. I think if you create the conditions on set and everyone knows their character really, really well, my job becomes easier because all I'm doing at that point then is turning on the camera and capturing what comes out. With the provider that we've a certain amount of time and certain things have to be hit, certain plot points and whatnot. Yeah. So you did you get the script to a certain point and then you cast the film and then you continued working on on the script? Well, uh, we, we, we were very sure about Don O'Haley early on, and I had written perhaps maybe the fourth or fifth draft at that point. And having spoken with him, I knew we'd, we'd be a good fit because he had a similar sensibility, I think. And all of the actors, I must say, they, they loved the approach because they, what they told me was normally that they're not given that amount of freedom. So I think you can see that in the performances and they were really, really happy to do that. Now, you know, I, I, could, I could envisage a situation whereby an actor would be uncomfortable with that. But I think a lot of the casting decisions we made related to the sensibility of the actors. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, so did you, did you then, did you have pretty much the entire cast or the central cast when you started these these workshops uh at that point yeah we we had cast um the shivon character the dev character and of course john condith um and the paddy character so yeah i guess you could say that the the, the the main guys were in situ by the time we we, we began workshopping mm -hmm. been about a good it must have been six months out from filming i think paddy something, something like yeah that. Well, i mean john was there a year, a year before he was, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, he was actually living in the States at the time. So we were Zooming, <laughs> we were <laughs> Zooming down in Loheli in the early days prior to COVID. Right. So, yeah, so did this, um, did this take place before COVID or, or were you shooting at all during? We, the, the main thrust of the filming happened pre-COVID. It would have happened November 2019 into December 2019. Um, we held back a few days for, for pickups and whatnot, 
Um, lockdown happened in Ireland in March, I think, late February, early March 2020, and we were editing at that point. So we had planned to shoot another three days, uh, but COVID prevented that until the following summer. And then we we managed to um, go out and film quite a few scenes in, in, during summer 2020. So COVID certainly affected us, uh, but more so the editing rather than the, the filming, I guess. Right. Um, yeah. So, Patty, had you done, had you worked with, with filmmakers who did this kind of workshopping in the in the early stages the way the way sean did um yes i'd worked with quite a i mean another director who only it was a tv drama it's even more unusual but he'd only done theatrical work uh so i was very open to it um and i think if i were sometimes you it's these, these margin calls about how you go about making a film. I think to some extent, films, clothes have been stolen by TV drama in recent years. And so people who have a different approach to making a movie uh, are very desirable now today, um, be that you know theatrical or be it somebody coming from music videos um i often think that somebody coming with a new approach from a different background can only bring something additional once you don't let them go too crazy <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so i mean sean were there were there certain keys that you know do, important things that you felt came out of came out of the workshop that that wouldn't have been there otherwise yeah i think i think so yeah um a lot of it i, I think the pacing of the film kind of came out through the, the workshops and um we certainly need to shape donald's performance um we, we came up with this kind of formula whereby he was um the john Cunliffe character was about six seconds slower than everyone else so if you can imagine, he was asked a question, he'd wait one, an answer. So that came out of the workshops, for example. And um, the Siobhan character, we we kind of went down the route. We, we tried to imagine what she might have been going through at that time in her life, her ambitions. Um, the property ladder in Ireland, property and getting on the property ladder is quite a big talking points in Ireland amongst people in their late 20s, early 30s. So we tried to add a little bit of that into, into it. That came up through, through the workshops. And just her general ambitions in life and how they might connect with this kind of John Cunliffe character. Because in the real world, uh, John Cunliffe would be so shy, he, he probably wouldn't be able to speak at all with you know, anyone of the opposite sex. Um, so we had we we had to we had some challenges to get over and um, we just I, I think I think the characters really really grew in those in those workshops, albeit mm -hmm. we did have uh, a rough plan and we of course had Don Ryan's novel as a as a backup as well. So we strayed a little bit, but not all that much. I think when you when I think back over it now, yeah, I think the what struck me from the workshops was a verite came out of them and that's actually something that annoys me when i go to the theater they're so flipping over rehearsed and over workshops that i actually don't believe it's happening on stage um but in this instance some of the two-handers with siobhan and john when they're doing the washing up and what have you it just looks like real life unfolding in front of your eyes and that's the result of deep character workshopping um so i don't know the, the the machinations of what you do the dark art of that workshopping <laughs> but sometimes you can overflip and workshop sure uh, and sometimes it can produce great results but i can watch that film and i can see the benefits of workshopping the next time i put a budget together uh i'll certainly be cognizant of making space and time for that when it achieves those 
really deep verite results. Yeah, and you would you wouldn't you wouldn't achieve that, I don't think, um, without having an intimate knowledge of the characters, without having the actors spend some time as the characters. And it was almost like interviewing them, asking them, how do you feel about this? And what would you do in this situation? And letting them go to a point. And you know, you you would just some some amazing things would come out through that. So that scene that you mentioned, Patty, is one of those. I think that was that was very, very successful. Um, and we took that on towards the filming as well. You know, it was budget dependent, time dependent, but we said, you know, I, I had this idea whereby we would have the scene set up on the day, whatever the lines of dialogue were and the action and all of that. And I would ask the actors to imagine what happened, you know, two minutes before that. And let's act that reach the scene, the point in the script that we were meant to film and then keep going afterwards, you know? So I had the camera crew around me and they'd all be expecting me to call cuts, but I was thinking, oh no, the interesting things are happening now. We might find something, we might find something out now. So we'd let the camera roll and um, that all comes from the approach and that comes from a sense of trust, I think, in the material that we had and in the actors themselves that they, and they were completely, uh, engrossed, I think, in, in their roles. And uh, like I said, it was kind of like just turning the camera on them and seeing what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so much so, Steve, that, uh, you know, the main location in the film is, it was, it's actually a family who'd, they'd all left for America, actually. They dealt with, I think they're in Pittsburgh or somewhere, the people who owned that house, that main location. And Sean was telling me that Donal wanted to sleep in the house. <laughs> it's been abandoned for two years. I don't know what kind of uh, vermin were, were involved um, there. But anyway, I managed to talk him out of it and we got him out with, with a bit of heating. Um, but then Sean told me the composer wanted to come over from Iceland and the composer wanted to sleep in the house. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know what you're doing, Sean, to all the, the, the cast and crew, but they all were really kind of bought into this sense of realism um so much so that the composer wanted to get to work in the upstairs bedroom in the, in the abandoned house i didn't i did in fact write the very last script or a good majority of the last script in the house you know mm. um so so how much of what's in the movie actually comes from those moments before and after the the scripted scenes. Hmm, that's 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 a good question. Um, they're just moments, I would say. I guess if you, I, I wouldn't, I couldn't give you a, a mathematical answer to that. Um, but they're just some moments. I, I I see them as these glances, and I just see truth in the eyes of the, of, of the characters. Um, certainly, a lot of the, that scene with the washing up. Would, would be an example of that. Um, there's a scene whereby John kind of asked Dave to teach him how to chat up a girl. You know, that that's probably a good example of it, whereby mm -hmm. uh, we let the guys go, and they're you know they're they've, they've been drinking all day and they're drunk and they slur their words and um, they talk about masturbation <laughs> and whatnot and. Um, that's an example of, of setting the scene, I think, um, explaining to them, you know, the amount of movement they could make, you know, in terms of where the camera placement was and all of that and getting them to let go, you know, and, uh, they were exhausted after that scene. I remember that, you know, we, we, we shot quite a few takes. We shot maybe seven or eight takes for that in comparison to the other scenes. And, uh, that's probably a good example of what I'm, uh, talking about yeah. mm -hmm. and there's great surprises in it too i guess you know that mm -hmm. scene a portion of it gets quite homoerotic uh and they're not very they're not those kind of guys let's say <laughs> um and that wasn't say in the script but i guess when you let people delve deep into a deep character that you'd be surprised what will come out you know yeah yeah that that, that was that was, i think that was great i really, really think that was great we did have a bit of a chat about that. And um, again, I think 
people are complex you know there's a wide array of feelings and we're on all sorts of different spectrums and uh you know even if that wasn't in the novel or in the script um you know there there the sense of need that john felt um would allow the space for something like that to happen i think and if there was a real john cunliffe and if he was getting drunk with his best mate who he doesn't really know and <laughs> possibly taking advantage of him who knows what feelings would come through but i think you need to get into that zone to to to, to find that kind of interesting conflict and um characterization yeah all right so so why was it important to shoot this um and to to move the story to the to the west of ireland rather than than the midlands well i take that one buddy um why well well it was to be shot in the irish language so the the western part of ireland they're they're, they're what, what are called gaeltos irish-speaking regions uh, and for for the realism because we wanted to make film in irish uh it would, for it to be real, uh, it had to be in one of the Gaelic regions. I'm from a Gaelic region. I'm a native Irish speaker. I grew up with Irish, and uh, it just seemed like a natural fit, and it seemed right. And there were, um, in terms of funding and whatnot, there were there were reasons that Paddy might get into. So uh, we moved the story from the Midlands, which is County Tipperary, uh, where the novel is set, to uh, the west coast and to the Connemara region. Uh, where I'm from. Um, I guess to reiterate a cliche of the landscaping part of the story, um, we move this to the mountains of Connemara. There's two aspects to that. Uh, often you'd see coastal west of Ireland represented on screen. You don't see the sea in this movie. Uh, it's all lakes and mountains. We went on recce's and those houses we saw the sun doesn't caress these houses for three months of the winter. So it's those kind of people who live a lot in darkness and the mountain because part of their personality. That was John's life. The mountains were in his marrow. Every townland he knew by name, um, but he couldn't name the president of the United States. Uh, this was his world. Um, that's part of it. But also he's an outsider in a world that's a bit far away from law enforcement from uh what we term civilization so if you are in a little bit of trouble you got to stand up in your own two feet and that was one big challenge for john in this milieu um how would he stand up his own two feet when the local land developers are trying to take his land from him um, and then when people who would be deemed slightly more sophisticated than him from the city, um, uh, a nurse, for instance, how he, he would deal with that and how he goes into the world from his mountaintop for the first time. It's almost like a, an old fable of the outsider trying to make his way in the world. So I think it was really advantageous for us to bring it to North Connemara. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, I, I assume that the, the original novel was in English rather than Irish? It was, yeah. Yeah. I mean, is it is it important to, you know, to continue making films in in Irish? I think I think, Sean, you've you've actually, you know, written about the importance of, of language before. But um, what, you know. Oh, yeah, very, very much. Um, Irish is our national language. We have two official languages, English and Irish. Um, growing up, um, I mean, you can count on one hand the amount of films made, feature films made, made in Irish. So I feel is sense of responsibility to um, to make Irish dramas, and um, to be given this opportunity is I, I'm, I'm not joking. It really is a privilege and, and an honour. And there is a bit of responsibility to, to it to make it a reasonably good job of it, which I hope I've done. Um, yeah, to, to present our world, our culture on screen and to, to, to have it, you know, even at this stage, going to various festivals around the world and to be 
uh, hopefully amongst the, the, the finalists in the best international feature, um, the Oscars would be amazing, of course. So there's a sense of responsibility to that. And um, it's our world. And uh, we want to share it. And we want you to see it and know of it. And uh, I think we probably want to share it with uh, the east coast of Ireland as well and the, uh, the cities and to let them have a look as well. Because we, we have great stories to tell. And uh, we hope they're interesting. And we hope there's a universality to it as well. And, and truth, truth being the main thing. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, Patty, as, as a producer, do you have, is there infrastructure? Do you have, um, you know, the ability to, to make movies easily in the mountains in the West? Yeah, well, we're small is beautiful. Uh, we are a small outfit. Uh, you know, your bigger crews couldn't get into those locations that we shot up those mountains. Um, so that is great. But in terms of the language, uh, there's been a few films in recent years, which is great. Um, but Two Swallows Don't Make a Summer, I had a real ambition for the Irish language film industry to you know, make five, six films a year. Um, it would be fantastic if you know, the support was there. TG Cahar and Screen Ireland are supporting uh, indigenous Irish language filmmaking uh, with a view to making world cinema. You know, that's what we're at. Um, but then you look to Iceland, which is a population a tenth of our size, and they make five, six movies a year easily. Um, so I think it's a great start, um, but I think watch this space. The Academy might be seeing Irish language movies every year. <laughs> With any luck. Um, yeah, I know a, a couple of years ago, the Irish entry was set in Cuba and was in Spanish, but um, I know the last the last couple of them have, have certainly been Irish language films. Um, That's right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're a broad church, that's for sure. Uh, you know, who knows, the next one might be in Polish. We have a big Polish population here. Um, but in this instance, uh, with uh, Shelter, we're particularly delighted to show Irish culture in its very, very native form. Um, and there's a beauty we, there's, there's a beauty in the cadence, in the language, in the manner of speaking. I'll give you an example that may be lost on subtitles. Um, Paddy, the old guy, says to John, Cowell the Yefer Igdal, which literally translates into, where is your hurry bringing you? Um, so you have that kind of wealth of, of poetic mm -hmm. native language um, that for us as experiencing uh, a movie, it's just so nice to see those characters in that language on screen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there, there's there's some moments that I I feel are really dramatic later in the film where, you know, I mean, we're sticking with John. So even when, you know, their their car is is attacked by the local bully and she's outside the car fighting, we're not outside the car with Javon fighting. We're inside the car with John. And the sound is muffled and and all. I mean, it's a um, you know, Sean. Can you talk a little about you know doing that where it's you're so much in John's in John's head as these other things are going on? Well, that co that comes back to the now to the to the script and one of the creative decisions uh, I mentioned it earlier. Um, the novel is so internal. I mean, it's it's it really is internal, and all of his thoughts are given out and, and, and written, of course. And that was the challenge. And like I said, I was really interested in the challenge of adapting that. So even the formal aspects of bringing that to the screen, that was going to be really interesting to me. So an early decision was, right, OK, how to best reflect that? Well, every single scene will be about John, will involve John, and will be from his perspective, I guess. And I think we have something like 83, 84 scenes altogether. Uh, and, you know, what a responsibility for Donald Haley. He has to carry them all. Um, so absolutely, when we, we when we come to that point, uh, and that's a real uh, Rubicon moment because that was his, that was, was John's um, chance to shine, to be the, the knight in shining armor. And of course, 
he wasn't ready for that and he couldn't do it and he didn't have the skills or ability or the guts uh, to do that. So I think where else would the camera be? Where else would we be but looking directly at him as that is happening outside him? And it's it's always fascinated me um, the placement of a camera in any film or what, what the director is uh, making you look at because you, you, you don't get a choice. The audience doesn't get a choice. So there are things happening outside the frame and I like the audience to be thinking and wondering and trying to figure out what's happening um, outside of the frame. But it's my choice, thankfully, <laughs> or <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know, but it's my choice. And I'm, I'm, I'm wanting you to, 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 to just look at John, see how he's reacting, see how he's feeling, see what's going through his mind. Um, mm -hmm. that, yeah. that was the choice and it seemed right. I think there's just to add to that, there's two, I mean, that's very much a nadir scene for John. Um, but also the film is about masculinity and it's a deep study of masculinity in a male world. Um, and if somebody, you know, it's a scene of humiliation for John and emasculation. Uh, so when I am looking at it, I am looking at every inch of his face to see how he's reacting because it's it's a horror show <laughs> what's going on outside the car uh and he just feels powerless and that's his um a character at that point in the story you know certainly is and uh yeah he's he's at a, a low point of course and um the next scene says a lot as well you know he's in the, in the room by himself so structurally we we had this idea that John is um, from what could be, I suppose, just right an upward tra trajectory, and Chauvin's on kind of on a on on the other way around, and that's always nadir for for um, for Chauvin as well for what what happens. But I think that's the point that you that the characters realize anyway that they'll never be together, not properly, and um, ultimately the film is about John and his perspective on what's happening around him as we're trying to get him to emerge from, from the shelter. He just isn't quite ready. The car is his shelter, I guess, at that point. Yeah. I, I feel like the sound design is also so central to what you're doing there and, and um, so intricate in many ways. And in, in that scene and in other scenes where you're, you know, you're dropping out sound that we, we might be hearing, or we're going, you know, in some cases to, to silence, um, you know, how, um, how did you work out the the sound design on those moments? Yeah, I'm a huge fan of um, British director Lynn Ramsey. And mm -hmm. um, I remember she quoted Robert Bresson and, uh, in, a, in a short interview that I, that I saw online that she, she gave a number of years ago. And uh, Bresson apparently said, you know, when there is sound, you don't need vision when there's vision you don't need sound you know sometimes you should give priority to one or the other and that fascinates me and certainly you're trying to elevate the dramatics and whatnot and to try and get inside this character you know to get inside and to try and uh, see how an introvert thinks feels sees hears um and I think if you can isolate certain certain sounds at certain points, that gives a sense of that. And I say that I'm pretty qualified for that because I'm kind of introverted too. So I, I kind of, I know how it feels. <laughs> so I think you're probably referring to that scene and there's there's the other violent scene or we, he, he goes to the, the local takeaway and and uh, buys chips and we had music from, from the, the bar coming over, the music that the girls are listening to and Somehow that just seems to say a lot. It seems to say, seems to suggest the different um, different things that are that are going against each other. The modern music versus the the country and old style music. Uh, what's happening outside the car and what's happening inside the car. Um, it's an effort to try and make us see, feel, hear how our main character is, and I hope it helps the audience connect with him. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, I mean, at, at the very end, you know, we won't get into specifics, but, um, you know, there's there's a moment where 
I guess, you know, he, he has a small triumph and the look on his face shows you how much it means to him. Um, you know, you can take it as, you know, he's done something, this is a new beginning for him and you can take it as, well, he's probably fooling himself here. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, what was, you know, what what choices led up to deciding that that's the way you wanted to, to end the film? Well, we we didn't want to go the way the novel ended, um, which was darker and um, which tied up some, some of the loose ends in a different way. Uh, I love the novel, I love the ending and all that, but it just didn't seem to go with what, what we had worked out with our characters and with our various drafts. So that was one issue, if you like. Um, I'm, I love, there's a poem by Patrick Cavney, he's an Irish poet called Epic. And I guess I love the aesthetic of that poem because it seems to be about how what might appear and feel small for one person from, from, from a different vantage is actually huge for them, you know? And I like that idea that, that John's world, it, he could be Columbus, you know, reaching you know, uh, America, uh, doing what he does. I won't mention what happens at the end, but that, that could be, that, that, that's his equivalent. And there's a great line in that poem by Patrick Havner, you know, gods make uh, them, their own importance, you know? Um, and that was dr driving us creative, creatively in terms of what we wanted to, to end up. And uh, I mean, you know, we don't need the Hollywood ending for everything. We don't need to, you know, we don't need to go down that route. We can, we can make something big out of something small. And uh, that was the kind of aesthetic value uh, that was going for. I think also, Steve, we're enslaved to Christianity here. We need some redemption. We need to resurrect at the end. Uh, <laughs> the promise of resurrection. <laughs> right. it's, a, it's a narrative imperative. Um, you know, makeup. Yeah. And this idea that, uh, you know, you're wondering, Steve, there, what happened to him afterwards. And I think we could all, we, we can fill in our own blanks and we can all have come up with something differently. It might surprise you to know that he actually became a Formula One driver. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. That would surprise me, yes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, you know, I, I, I heard stories from the Catholic nuns when, when uh, Irish Catholic nuns when I was growing up, and and you're growing up there. So yes, we we have certain narratives. I think we uh, we expect. Yeah, well, repression is a big thing too, Steve. Yes. Uh, you know, um, joking aside, John is is quite repressed, and uh, Ireland has come through quite a period of repression, sexual repression, that all plays out in terms of, you know, growing a male in Ireland in this kind of closeted world. Um, but I think that's a big theme as well, uh, you know, emotional repression and how to try and kind of break through that glass ceiling, if you like. Uh, I think that's also very interesting thematically. Yeah. And we yeah. can't blame the nuns for it all. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, well, I think we probably need to wrap up at, at this point. Um, but, you know, thank you. Thank you for a beautiful film. Um, to the people who are watching, you know, thank you. It was great to have you here today. Um, for more screenings and, and to look at, to watch screenings you might have missed, you can also take advantage of our free trial to Rap Pro or go to the rap.com and click on the screenings tab. Um, so, Sean, Patty, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, you know, the, the, film, the film was terrific and the conversation was fun. Thank you so much, Steve.